Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Yeah, welcome. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be opening for us today. And I haven't done this in a while. But anyways, I'm, I'm sure it'll come back like riding a bicycle. So you have, what, a week left? Actually, I hear it's almost two weeks left before school actually starts, right? So you got some time left still. So don't freak out. You still have two weeks before school. Yeah, you don't have to think about that school just yet. You still got another weekend before you got to do all your school supply shopping and things start to get back to normal where you have to go back to sleeping early again at a normal time. But that's okay. That's the rhythm of life. We have our summer, we have our fall, we have our winter, and then we start going back up into spring again. And that's just a rhythm that we have to get used to, but it's okay. It's okay because in that rhythm, God is also with us. He has set that rhythm for us so that we can actually enjoy life. We can actually go about life. There will be highs, there will be lows, and yet God is with us through it all. And so as we worship this morning or as we go into worship, I'm just going to invite you to take a moment to close your eyes. So why don't we all close our eyes, and for those at home, you can join in and close your eyes as well. And we did this exercise at the retreat for those who were there. And let's just take a moment to breathe. Just inhale. Exhale. Inhale again. And exhale. And let us remember that this is the very same breath that God gave to Adam when he first breathed into his nostrils. It is the same breath that sustains us even now, that it is in us, that he is in us, and that he has given us his spirit as well, who lives in us, who is teaching us what it means to be followers of Christ, who is transforming us to be more like Christ. So let us just breathe for this moment as we come into God's presence. Lord, we thank you for the breath of life. We thank you, not, it's just our, not just our physical life, the physical breath that you have given us, but also the very breath of life that is your spirit that now dwells in us as well. We thank you, God, that you are the one who keeps us going, that even when we feel like we can't breathe or things are choking us and heavy upon us, that you help us to breathe, that you help us to go through the challenges knowing that on the other side of the challenge that you are there waiting and you are ready to embrace us you are ready to uh, welcome us into your arms so lord we offer up this worship to you today knowing what you have already done through your son jesus christ and every breath that we breathe may it be for you in jesus name we pray amen let us rise for worship
Father, I just want to thank you so much for um, letting us all gather here once again. Um, Lord, uh, even though it is a little um, humid and the weather is kind of hot, thank you for bringing us wind um, to let us stay cool. Um, I pray that you would just um, watch over us as we, as we have around two more weeks left of summer break and help us to um, you know, not let it go to waste and just spend time to refresh in ourselves and to um, reconnect with you, Lord. Um, I just want to thank you so much for always looking after us, and I pray that you will um, be with Pastor Edgar as he preaches the sermon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning once again, and welcome to Sunday Worship. Why don't we just take a moment to turn to our neighbors, say the Lord be with you, and let us pass the peace to one another that we have received from the Lord. And for those who are worshiping at home, the Lord be with you as well. The Lord be with you, the Lord be with you, Christina, Slynn, Kayla, Janaya, Karis, all of you. Okay, just a few announcements to go through this morning. The first is, Pastor Edgar is going to be sharing God's word today. And so let's give him a big round of applause for that. Yeah. Next is baptism and confirmation classes. Today is the last day to sign up. So please do email me if you have been thinking and praying about it. I have gotten a few responses and classes will actually be starting this week. I'm going to send out the um, time, date, and Zoom link. It actually is going to be online this time as well because that's a little bit more convenient at this time. Third, the Grade 7 Welcome. So Friday, September 10th at 6.30 p.m. here at church, we're going to be welcoming the new Grade 7 class that is coming up. So please do come out and let's give them a big welcome when they join us. And uh, yeah, it'll be fun, I promise. Lastly is uh, Awana volunteers. Pastor Edgar is still looking for Awana volunteers. So if you're interested, please do talk to him. Oh, he says no. Oh, you are. <laughs> Nobody messaged him apparently. So. Um, He's going he's gonna to bring some fire today while, when he preaches. Just expect that, okay? At this time, I'm going to call on uh, Teacher Francis to actually lead us in the scripture reading. Okay, uh, let's open up your bulletin to 2 Kings 24, 8 to 20. Okay, so here it goes. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Neushta, daughter of El Nathan. She was from Jerusalem. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father had done. At that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came up to the city while his officers were besieging it. Jehochin, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, his officials, and all surrendered to him. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehochin prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> sorry, removed the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and cut up the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temples of the Lord. He carried all Jerusalem into exile, all the officers, fighting men, and all the skilled workers and artisans, um, a total of 10,000. Only the poorest people of the land were left. Nabuc <laughs> Nabuc Nab sorry, Nabuchadnezzar, how do I pronounce this again? Uh, Nabuchadnezzar. Nabuchadnezzar, yeah, um, took Jehochin captive to Babylon. He also took from Jerusalem to Babylon the king's mother, his wives, his officials, and all the prominent people of the land. The king of Babylon also deported to Babylon the entire force of 7,000 fighting men, strong and fit for war, and a 1,000 skilled workers and artisans. 
He made Matania, the uh, Jehochin's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother's name was Hamatal, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as Jehoiakim had done. It was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah. And in the end, he thrust them from his presence. Now Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. This is the word of God. Amen. Uh, thanks, Francis. I know those some of those names are a little bit of a tongue twister there. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone online. And it's, uh, it's just such a privilege just to preach in person. Uh, I think it's been over close to two years since I've done this. Uh, usually you just preach online and through a camera or through a screen and so it's feels really good to come up here and, and just have this privilege to preach in front of you um, so uh, as we just read from the passage um, there are two things we're going to learn from this sermon uh, today and those two things are first one is there are no good kings of Israel or Judah uh, in, in fact, there, there are just no good human rulers at all, all right? We're all broken. We're all fallen. Uh, we all have something <laughs> that, uh, that just, uh, just goes against God. Um, there, there's, there's none. There's no one that's good but one, all right? And I'm pretty sure we kind of know who that one is, but we'll get to that um, or get to him. And the second thing we're going to learn to do today is God does what he says. He always does what he says, right? And so uh, going to the bad news, um, there are no good kings or rulers in Israel or Judah, all right? And who's ever watched, uh, and, and I'm really hoping you guys seen this, these movies, The Lord of the Rings. Who's seen The Lord of the Rings? Some of you guys? Not all of you? Okay, maybe... Okay, I, I would encourage you guys to watch it if you're old enough, and then um, definitely read the books if you if uh, they're they're kind of long, but definitely <laughs> read the books. But they're really good. Um, and if you watch Lord of the Rings, sp specifically the Fellowship of the Ring, the first movie, uh, there's a part of the movie where Frodo uh, gets to Rivendell with the One Ring, and he finally gets there. He's Oh no, he's kind of banged up. <laughs> there goes my first part of my sermon, but uh, he's kind of banged up. And what ends up happening is that there's, uh, as he gets there, uh, there's a meeting between Gandalf and Elrond. Okay, Gandalf's the wizard, the gray guy, um, and then Elrond is the uh, the, el the elf guy, and they're having a discussion of what to do with the ring, where to take it, can it stay in Rivendell? Um, and Elrond tells Gandalf, the power of the elves cannot hold the ring here. Uh, it's just unsafe. It needs to go. And who can we trust it to? Who can we trust to save us during these dark times? And then Gandalf looks to Elrond and he says, um, at the end of the day, it can't be the dwarves. Uh, it can't be any of the other races. It has to be the men. And Elrond gives Gandalf this just this disappointed look, and he says, men, men are weak. And the reason why he says that is because um, the very first king, if you've seen the movies, the very first uh, well, human king or one of the human kings of Gondor, uh, he had the ring and he had the chance to destroy the ring, but because of temptation, the temptation of power, he failed to do it. He failed. And because he failed, all of the race of men failed. And you can kind of see some of the similarities coming in the line with, with the Bible, right? And since then, there hasn't been a king in Gondor. All right? And in ruling in his place would be these stewards, these people that would take care of the kingdom, but they're not rightfully the king. And over time, these stewards, uh, they just decline over time 
uh, their morality, the way they rule, the way they see things, and it literally ruins uh, the kingdom of men. Literally ruins. And you can see why Elrond had no faith in the world of men. All right? And likewise, when we look at this, cha- uh, this passage today, uh, and especially when you read First and Second Kings and Chronicles, and um, you wonder why you're reading uh, th- these parts of the Bible, and it can get really repetitive. It can get really, sometimes, I'll, I'll be honest, it can get a little boring uh, at times. Um, but the reason why you read this is because uh, we find this message that there is no good king in Israel or Judah at all. There are no good human rulers. And that includes uh, David and Josiah, that people you may have heard in the Bible. That includes them. There is a decline um, amongst these rulers. And it all starts in 1 Samuel chapter 8, where uh, the people come to the last judge of Israel, who is Samuel, and they demand a king. They demand a king from Samuel and from God. And when they demand a human king, uh, Samuel was thinking, well, if you're demanding a human king, you're rejecting God as king. And he comes before God and says, they're rejecting, uh, I can't believe it, they're, they're rejecting you. And God's like, yes, they're, they're not rejecting you, Samuel, they're rejecting me. And they want a human king. But you know what? I'm going to give them one, and they're going to see what it looks like. And so we have the very first king of Israel, and his name was Saul. And he was appointed, and let me tell you, long story short, he was no good. He was no good. It didn't start off well. Okay, he disobeyed Samuel, disobeyed God, and it just did not go well. Then we have the second king of Israel, who is David. Starts well, right? He's uh, known as the man after God's own heart. But what's up happening? He, start, he, has a, an, uh, an, he commits adultery with Bathsheba. He fails miserably. And after that adultery, let me tell you, King David has never, after that point, won a major battle. There was a decline in his kingdom after that point. There was a failure that he did, and there was a continued decline. And then later we have King Solomon, who um, brought Israel prosperity and wealth. But later as well, there was a decline. And then throughout this sermon series, you guys found out there was a split in the kingdom between the uh, uh, two kings. And as you continue to go on, we get to a guy named Manasseh, all right? And let me tell you, Manasseh is, he's like the the poster child of, like, if if you want to know how to, am I allowed to say this, but if you know, if you want to learn how to piss God off, okay, just do what Manasseh does, all right? Uh, he is, he is the one person that you do not follow as an example, you know, uh, to, to get on good, God's good side. In, in fact, he does the exact opposite. He is one of the kings that leads the uh, kingdom of Judah into such idolatry, away from God, to the point where there's even human sacrifices, all right? And he sacrifices his own son to these false gods, his children. That is horrible, so detestable before God's eyes. Where God finally goes to, uh, and says to him, and, and it, it says, The Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him. He has led Judah into sin with idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. Do you hear that? There's gonna, it's going to be so bad for him, your ears are going to tingle. It's like watching one of those uh, YouTube videos of someone getting injured. You're, you're like, ooh, ouch, that hurts. And you're like, oh, no, oh, no, that is not right. That is not right. And and God is saying, that's going to happen to Manasseh. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. 
That's what's going to happen to him and to you guys. That, this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, because of these detestable things. They're horrible things that these people people are doing. Um, they're turning away from God, and they're, and they're killing the blood. Uh, I mean, they're sacrificing the blood of the innocent. And then he says, I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line used against Samaria and the plumb line against the house of Ahab. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one who wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. It's like, I'm going I'm to just wipe you guys off. Wipe, you know, wipe on, wipe off. That's what I'm going to do with you guys. I'll forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies. They'll be looted and plundered by all their enemies. They have done evil in my eyes, and I have aroused my anger from uh, the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until this day. That is horrible. There is such a decline. And then we come to Josiah, King Josiah. Um, and there was some reform with Josiah. He found the book of the law in the temple and, uh, and brought people back to the Lord and back to God. And things were looking great. There was uh, some repentance going along. There was uh, people coming back to God. They were tearing down the idols and the high places and all these things. And, and it, w it was a celebration for sure. Um, but at the end of the day, he goes off into battle. And what happens to Josiah? He dies in a battle. Does Josiah come back to lead his people? No. He stays dead. And guess how quickly those people turn away from God the moment Josiah dies? It's like, boom, instantaneously, the next day. All right, let's put these high places back up. Let's put these idols back up. Let's do everything like we used to do. Now that the boss man is gone and we've gotten someone new coming in. And even God says this in 2 Kings chapter 23, 26, 27. It says, Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away from the heat of his fierce anger, which burned against Judah because of all that manas they had done to arouse his anger. So the Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my presence as I removed Israel, and I will reject Jerusalem, the city I chose, and this temple about which I said, My name shall be there. Even during Josiah's reign. And then we come down to the line where we come to read today's passage of the last two kings of Judah. Jehoiachin did evil in the eyes of the Lord, right? He continued to do that. It says there. And he's following after uh, a man named Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim was the previous king who was a vassal under King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you don't know what a vassal is, it's like, you know, a country comes in, takes over, puts in a new government and then says you run you guys run it but we're still in charge okay uh we're as long as you give us money and troops and stuff like that we're still in charge and as long as you listen to us we're good but the moment you stop listening to us we're going to come in and we're going to take over again and so Jehoiakim uh had this bright idea to go against Nebuchadnezzar and uh he lost he lost pretty bad and during and during Jehoiachin's reign he finds the culmination of that loss and ends up surrendering and all and then that begins the exile of the people of Judah into Babylon including Jehoiachin and then finally they put Zedekiah to be the next king and to be that next vassal ruler saying hey don't do what Jehoiakim did all right follow us continue on but what does Zedekiah do he continues to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then just like Jehoiakim, Zedekiah betrays Nebuchadnezzar, thinking he can win. I'm pretty sure he had some advisors and maybe some false prophets telling him, hey, you know, God's not going to destroy Jerusalem. God's not going to do that. He's not going to destroy the temple. Come on. You're going to win. Just do it. Right? And what does Zedekiah do? He betrays Nebuchadnezzar and then was later defeated and then all his sons were executed, and his eyes were taken out for punishment. Every king of Israel and Judah had failed, and therefore God had to do what he said. You know, and that comes to the second thing. God does what he says, all right? If you break the covenant and sin against God and not repent, 
he will punish and discipline. In Numbers chapter 23, 19, uh, it says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? God does what he says. And this is coming from a, a person that's not even an Israelite, Balaam. All right? <laughs> and he's saying he, he knows enough about God that when God says something, he's going to do something. He's not human. He doesn't go back on his word. And whatever he says happens. Um, when we follow the covenant and promises of good things, we can see that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Joshua 1. And then if you, fall, if, you, if you break the covenant, there's implications to that. You know, bad things will happen. We see that with the kings of Israel. You've been following that in this whole series. And we see that in Manasseh, the mascot of what not to do with God. You just don't, you just don't follow this guy. And if you ever, had, you know, like some of the leaders here, you're all married. Um, if you ever have children, just don't name them Manasseh. Just don't. And if you... <laughs> And if you're out there and you're named Manasseh, just change your name legally. I'll, that's what I'll do. Th I'm done with Manasseh. All right? Just don't do Manasseh. We see bad things happen. And we also see it in Jeremiah. Jeremiah was there during that time. And in Jeremiah chapter 25, 4 to 14, uh, I'm not going to read all that. It's a little long, but just summarizing it. God will destroy Judah and Jerusalem because the people have sinned and not repented. All right, that's what's going to happen. God is going to do what He says. So why go through some of the history of Israel or Judah's kings, and to show that God does carry out what He says, if we continue to sin and break the covenant? Why go through the bad news? Well, to show that we cannot put our hope in other people or in us, and we need to repent. We cannot put our hope into human people, even our leaders. Not put all our hope in them because they're flawed. We fail. We sin. We will die. We will disappoint God and ourselves. We put our faith and trust in others and, our, and in, our, in our own ability. One day, we're not going to live up to it. There's, there's going to be a time where we will fail. And we need to believe, I don't know if you ever heard this, but it's called the doctrine. A doctrine is a, a really important truth that our faith really rests on. If we take that out, it kind of takes away our faith or what we really believe in. But a doctrine of total depravity, which is based on God's truth. And depravity meaning we are sinners through and through. We are broken. We are absolutely broken. Even the good that we do, I would argue, and even the Bible argues, is evil. Because there's a part of what we do, even if it's good, that competes with the glory of God. If we do good things, is it God's glory or is it ours? There's a competition. And, some, and if you're really honest with yourself, it's very real. And that could be another sermon. <laughs> that uh, uh, Pastor Ron can go into that. But, um, but yes, we are evil through and through. And if you don't believe that, here we go. I want to challenge you guys. If you don't believe in total depravity, I want to challenge you. Who's, who's ever worked before? Who's had ever had a job? Who's working right now? Come on, some of you guys are working. Hands up. Be proud. You're working. That's good. Right? But I want to challenge you to work in retail for three months, okay? Or any profession that involves people. And tell me, tell me to my face, oh, people are good. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just tell me, okay? I know there's maybe the few exceptions of some people that are really nice that come into the store. And yeah, but, you know, if you just change the situation just a little bit for them. They get a little flat tire. They had a bad week. Guess how they treat you, right? And then amongst the normal people that come in. And then you got bad people. So I want to challenge you. If you don't believe in that, work in retail for three months or any profession that involves people 
you will see brokenness. You will see failure. You will see sin. <laughs> you see it all the time. Like even uh, a couple of my friends, uh, I, I, they work in offices, and they'll be like, you know, you know, uh, you know, Kathy. Oh my gosh, she's so fake, so fake to me. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> there's brokenness in that, <laughs> right? And I'm sure we've been broken to them too. Um, there, there's, there's this failure. There's sin that permeates through all that we are, and oh, the stories I can share, because I've, I, I haven't been a pastor all my life. No, uh, I've worked at Second Cup. I've worked in HR and construction companies. I've um, uh, worked in telemarketing, oh my goodness. And I've also worked in tele-research and other research things. And I've seen the brokenness and sin <laughs> that happens everywhere. And now as a pastor, how I've seen congregants fail, how I've seen pastors fail, how I even see in myself how I have failed at times. We have all failed. We cannot put our hope in people or us. And that's what First, Second Kings and Chronicles is, is basically saying and what the passage is nailing home today. Let us confess our sins and weaknesses daily and put our hope uh, and not put our hope in people uh, or the people around us or even in ourselves. All right. Now that we're all depressed and sad, um, let me give you some hope as God did with the people during the kings of Israel and Judah. So to the good news, then who can we put our hope in? Who should we repent to? Well, the one in control, the one who is righteous and good, the one who has the qualifications to run this world and the universe, the one who has that resume. God is in control because in the midst of this doom and gloom, God is not surprised by how the people and kings have acted. He is in control, and whatever God says happens. False prophets and people were telling Zedekiah, hey, you will be victorious against Nebuchadnezzar. God's not going to let Jerusalem fall. If you betray him, you will win. God, God will do it. He won't let Jerusalem be destroyed. You will win. Meanwhile, God is saying, no. The time has come for everything to happen, as I said. Judgment is coming. Who was right? Who was right? Were the people, were all these wise advisors to Zedekiah and false prophets, all these people, were they right? Was Zedekiah right? Who was right? It was God. Because he's in control. And he does what he says, and there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing. But because God is in control, we can also have hope because, again, everything he says will happen. God does what he says. God gives hope, too, even in the midst of judgment and promises of destruction because of sin. He also promises someone that, can put, that we can put our hope in and have restoration and healing. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, um, God speaks to David and says, Hey, David, I'm going to put someone from your offspring on your throne who's going to rule forever. He's going to be the right guy. He's not going to fail. This I promise in the midst of all this brokenness. In Jeremiah chapter 33, 14 to 18, uh, Jeremiah reiterates that promise. The promise of restoration from desolation. He writes, in, in those days and at that time, I'll make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. This king will be just and right. So there are all, every ruler in this world, we've, we've all failed and or will fail. And God does what he says, but there will be one king, one king who will not fail. And he will be called Lord, our righteous Savior. How does this title 
compared to any of the kings of Israel or Judah or anyone you may have heard of or know. How does it compare? How does this compare to Manasseh? <laughs> right? Exact opposite. The Lord is righteous. He is Savior. He's the exact opposite. There is one king that will be good, and that is good. And this Lord, righteous Savior, is the one king um, that will be good, and who alone is good? God. God alone is good. And if we flip ahead a bunch of pages in the Bible, we will see that person is Jesus Christ. And how does a carpenter become the center of human history and has impacted everything today, whether we recognize it or not? Our laws, when you look at them, at the basis of our laws here in Canada, they're Christian in origin. They are. This is how much Jesus has affected us, whether we know it or not. He has come into this world as carpenter. How does a person like him do this? The way we tell time is based on the arrival of Christ, whether we like it or not. You know, back in my day, we called it um, B.C. and A.D. Do you guys still call that? Sometimes, yeah? Nowadays, it's what? Like, B.C. stands for be before Christ. Uh, A.D. stands for that Latin Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. That's, you know, very Christian, right? Um, but now they wanted to get that out of there. They, they wanted to get Christianity out, how we tell time. And so they called it C.E., Common Era, and then B.C.E., uh, Before Common Era, all right? And, okay, cool. Uh, okay, not cool, but... Um, but where, where, where does it all start? Where does Common Era start and where, where did BCE uh, end? Well, same thing, the arrival of Christ. You cannot take Christ out, <laughs> okay? You just can't. He had that much of an impact in our world. Regardless of what you call it, he's still centered. It's all centered around the arrival of Christ. So who is this Jesus, this carpenter, that we should follow as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord righteous Savior? Well, he's God's Son, holy, anointed, righteous, just, and the innocent one. He was the descendant of David. He was born of a virgin, as God had said, the Virgin Mary, the one fulfill, who fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy of the coming Messiah, as God had said. He is the one that never failed God or us. He had no official title or organization to empower him. He had no fancy education or lineage. He wasn't a lord. He wasn't a born of he wasn't like born as a human prince. He was born in a manger. And he had no official organization to say, "Hey, you're ordained now. You can do this." We recognize you. None of that. What made him so amazing and special? That people would follow him to the point of death. Well, it was him as a person. Who he was that drew people to him. He was innocent. He was right. He was just. He did not fail. That's what made him different from everybody else. And that's why people followed him. It wasn't a title that he got from inheritance or, uh, or in, a, in a way where, like, uh, or from some company that decided to give him that title. It was who he was. And he had an authority that was out of this world that every time he spoke, he was so sure of it. Of the truth of the word of God. He died on the cross because he loved us and loves us and took the punishment of all our sins. And here's the thing. Could death hold him as it held Josiah and any other human being on earth? Did he fail in that way where death will hold him? No, he didn't. He resurrected and he lives very much today. He resurrected. 
he has not failed. It is in him and his truth that we need to put our faith and hope in. All right? This world will fail you. It will. Get that truth into your head, <laughs> into your heart. It will. You will be disappointed. Friends and church members will hurt you. It's true. You know, I've been, I've been to so many different, you know, before I came to Young Nuck, um, yeah, I've, I've been hurt by brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm sure I've hurt them, you know. We failed each other. Pastors at one point will fail you too. Not Pastor Ron, though. <laughs> no, but pastors will. You know, we're only human. We're sinful too. Governments, teachers, you know, like <laughs> everybody looks sometimes looks to the government f to fix things, and it never happens. So I don't, it's weird. <laughs> uh, even today, we're looking to the governments. Uh, I don't know, right? Teachers, and and when you even look at other philosophies of life, you know, they they don't hold to the answer and hope that the truth of Jesus does. They don't. There's only one person that proved the truth of the word of God, and that is Jesus. And the word of God points to him and is him. So we need to stand firm. We definitely do. Because this world will tell us to put our hope in other things. And it will fail you. It will. You know, like, put your hope in your future job, in your future education and riches. Okay, you might be good at the time. And yes, you should be responsible. But when you put all your hope in those things, and you put your identity in those things, it's something different. I remember, like, um, years ago, uh, I was in Hong Kong visiting my brother. He worked for a big, pretty big insurance company at the time. Um, at the time, he worked for Manulife Financial. And uh, he was pretty up there in the business world in that area. And uh, I went to visit him. And uh, we decided to have uh, dinner, a barbecue dinner, at someone's condo. Um, uh, and his friend goes to the same church. And uh, so we decided to go, and we went. And we saw a lot of people there. And as I got to talk to each person, and a lot of them went to the same church, every one of them, let me tell you, was millionaires. Okay, there was this one woman, she was like in that, you know, like just, she, you could tell there was like, she's the boss, right? <laughs> you know, she tells you to do something, you just go do it. You know, she lived on the peak of Hong Kong, which is like where the rich people live. Um, and she had all that money. She all had all that status and power. She had all that. And she was like, yeah, I need to be responsible with my life. I need to do well to take care of myself, take care of my family. But she admitted to me, I remember, she was saying, but I put too much into this. I realized at the end of the day, what does this all mean? I put too much. Like, I'm going to fail. I'm going to die one day. Others are going to... Why did I... And, and let me tell you, she was single, too, still. And she was probably in her close to her 40s. And she was just saying, you know, honestly, I would rather just give up my job and all that I have. Just have a family, go to church, and do what God's telling me to do. Right? This is someone that had it all. And there was another person at that barbecue uh, who, uh, who had it all as well. And he said, he recently, he came up to me, I remember at that time recently, and said, hey, you know what, I quit my job. <laughs> I'm going to become a missionary. <laughs> he quit. He just quit. He's like, I saved up. I think I'm good enough to last a good while. Our church is going to support me, and this is what I'm going to do. Because this is what matters. This is the per, I want to put my hope in something else. Someone that won't fail me. And that's Jesus. And I'm not saying everyone here needs to go off and become a missionary or whatever, <laughs> go into whatever. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's good to succeed and do things well and be responsible. But 
it gets to a point where you have to understand where is your hope in, right? Is it in money? Is it in status? Is it in wealth? Is it in you? Is it in others? Because one day that will all fail. But God is saying there's one person, one person who will never fail you. And there's one truth that will never fail you. And that person is Jesus Christ. And that truth is in Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to leave you with today, with that encouragement. And so I know we're in this pandemic. It's been hard. Um, if anything, our, we, we'd be pretty clear that, you know, there are times where our health system did do well, and then there are times where our health system and government failed us, <laughs> okay? Um, but again, it just reiterates the point. Let's put our hope in Christ, whatever we're going through. Um, let's turn to him, and let's repent if we haven't. So, Let's just pray, and then we'll go from here. Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we come before you and we confess our brokenness, we confess our failures, confess our weaknesses as human beings. If we have not failed, we will at one point. It's just a matter of time, whether it be big or small. But God, help us to see that. That we don't put our ultimate hope in other things. To save us, to rescue us, to make our lives better, or whatever it is. Or fuller. But God, that we can put our hope in Jesus. The one and only King that did not fail. That does not fail. And who is alive and victorious today over sin that we can come before him and come before you, God the Father, in his name and be forgiven and be part of this family. That is just amazing. And so, Lord, help us to trust in that king, in King Jesus. And so, God, um, I hope this has encouraged us today and uh, help us to remember it as we go through even dark times. Um, as the people of Judah and Israel did. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand in response for worship.
bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us all here today and for those uh, joining us online. At this time, um, you know, it's supposed to be an offering prayer. And so uh, uh, even though we don't give right now, um, but as we do give sometime in the future, may we um, give willingly and also, as uh, Pastor Edgar said, hopefully, dear Lord, um, in hopes that we don't trust in other things, not in ourselves or other people, but trust in you, dear Lord, that um, with this offering or even with the offering of us and our services and what we can do to help our brothers and sisters around us, um, that it be for your good and um, to just further your kingdom. And so we thank you, dear Lord, and as we go through another, start another week, help us, dear Lord, to just offer ourselves up to um, pushing for your, your kingdom and to pushing your word. And so we thank you, dear Lord. We love you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's re uh, let's confess our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Edgar, once again for sharing God's word today. Let us receive God's good word and blessing for us this week. Please receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the unconditional love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and forever. Amen. 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 It was great seeing you. Go in peace. Get to some air conditioning. Stay cool and hydrated. And uh, we will see you again next week. Maybe indoors. Yeah. So do keep that in prayer. We might be back inside next week. But I will update you on that on Discord as uh, you figure it out or as I figure it out and get the word. Thank you. Have a great week. See you, everybody.